Will you welcome Keith Green? Oh, Keith, that's, that sounds like your music coming from the piano over there now. Just a little bit of it. That was a thrill. I heard last night about 150 young people came forward right. to give their lives to Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, tell, what kind of an appeal did you make to the young people there? What, tell us what happened. Well, um, I just, I really believe in modern day preaching. There's a real lack of the Lordship of Jesus. There's a real lack of preaching about Jesus being Lord. There's a lot of him uh, preaching about him being a financial supplier and a lot of him preaching about being healer and a lot of savior and what he can do for you. But there's so little preaching about what taking up your cross and following him and denying yourself and uh, I really been really been preaching a lot well when I go into uh, the average audience is probably 60 percent church kids you know kids that are that are in a fellowship and going to church or uh, some of them may have never really met Jesus they just following in on their parents coattails or something you know? guy doesn't have any grandchildren you know right. <laughs> so they've got to come into that relationship with him and uh, what I do is I present the Lordship of Jesus and the requirements of being his disciple uh, and a lot of people that figured they were saved because they went to church once a week or that their parents were Christians and they figure they got in just because their parents were Christians have come to realize that they'd never really submitted to the Lordship of Jesus and uh, then of course there's always the 10 or 15 or 20 percent of the audience that's never even been in a church right. and those people really get ministered to by the cost of following Jesus which is everything well I was at your concert uh, you were here uh, it was in, uh, in August, I think August, it was. Early August, right. And you were here uh, on 100 Hunter Street live in the morning. And then right. that night I went with my teenagers right. to do your concert. And I was absolutely thrilled with your ability to communicate. There was that combination of humor and just fun and, and entertainment. But at the same time, oh, the communication that was coming through you as you sat there and bounced on that piano. I mean, literally bounced. He plays yeah. with his whole body, mm -hmm. not just with his fingers when he plays the piano. But, uh, you know, your background. My mom sang with the Dorseys and my grandfather was with Eddie Cantor and so on. And uh, I know, you know, even in, in, uh, in your background, um, uh, religiously, I know your wife, I remember hearing her grandfather was a rabbi. And, right. And, uh, but here you have all this communication musically right. in your background uh, great music and uh, but now here you are well, I don't know if you completely know. sold out to the kind of music you're doing now which right. is communicating Jesus Christ right. I don't think you know that both my wife and I are born Jewish right and uh, there's a there's a real well there's there's a real movement on the west coast especially a lot of and, and we have a house ministry there. And my wife and I are kind of elders of a house ministry. We have about three houses and 20 young people. And uh, take people in off the streets and we go into prisons and go into ghettos and, and do different things that I really feel is lacking. You know, it's real easy to be a, a Christian recording artist and a Christian uh, concert artist and all these things. But it's when I go home is when, when it really gets to be, you know, down to uh, the bottom line, you know, of getting out on the streets and witnessing for Jesus and doing things that are so lacking, that I see lacking a lot. Uh, well, this, uh, this whole matter of, uh, of the Messiah. Now, right. Wednesday, we had a song uh, sung here, uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah, anyway. HaMashiach. HaMashiach, Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, HaMashiach, Hebrew for Jesus, our or Messiah. Messiah. Right. Or in Greek, that word Messiah comes through as Christ, but- Christos, right. Uh, Christos, but here we, here we have someone who came who was, as, as Dr. Ward said, the greatest Jew that ever lived, <laughs> right. Jesus. The world's oldest living Jew. <laughs> oh, hey, I like, <laughs> and, and at this time of the year, when we're thinking of, of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, the world's oldest living Jew. Right. But whatever happened to you that, that you came, did you, did you first say, come to believe that he was uh, maybe a good man or a good Jew before you believed that he was the the Messiah or the Christ or God in the flesh? Well, I have, a, I have even a stranger background because before I was born, my parents converted to Christian science. <laughs> I mean, they were Jewish. They were Jewish born. Right. And then they 
when I was born, I was born into a Christian science family, Jewish born. So I have all my relatives being Jewish and being brought up in Christian science, which is kind of like hot fudge and eggs, you know, together. It's kind of a strange mixture, you Yuck. know. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know. Uh, the funny thing about uh, Christian science is kind of like grape nuts. It's not grapes, it's not nuts, you know. It's not Christian, it's not science and scientific. And, and uh, I was brought up really confused, you know, because... Uh, I didn't even know I was Jewish till I was about 12 years old. <laughs> and uh, I was brought up with like the teachings of Jesus plus the teachings of metaphysics and different things and all kind of mixed together in a blender kind of a thing. And uh, uh, then all my relatives were Jewish and, and uh, uh, on the West Coast especially, the Judaism, unless it's Orthodox, is real just, you know, bar mitzvahs, funerals, weddings, and uh, Yom Kippur and uh, Passovers, you know, that's it, you know. and. Uh, so I, I'd, I'd go to uh, Seder's, which is the, uh, the practice of uh, the Passover feast and, the, and the, the dinner with the bitter herbs and the matzah and the lamb and all, and, and all that stuff, uh, with relatives. And I, I just I didn't understand what was going on, you know, because I wasn't brought up really uh, in anything but, you know, metaphysics, which was... Uh, Mind over matter. Then. Yeah, the, just positive thinking and uh, no doctors and the whole thing, you know. And uh, uh, so when I was about 15, I, 16... I rebelled against everything that I was brought up in because it was so confusing. You know, I, I didn't really have any kind of a base, a foundation. Uh, you know, because I, I was brought up, they were telling me that I really didn't have a body, you know. <laughs> and, you know, although I clothed it and fed it, it wasn't real, you know. And I was just walking around going, you know, what am I doing here, you know. So I, I went the whole route of uh, the young people. Uh, today and especially then on the west coast you know into the drugs and eastern religion and meditations and yoga and, and all these different things that uh, I figured were gonna satisfy me and, and they did for hours or days at a time but then I'd always come down and you know go well that's that didn't do it because I always knew that when I'd find true happiness and peace it would last and so you were just always searching searching oh, searching. Oh crazy yeah and uh, I searched with my whole heart and uh, in all the Eastern religions and all the cults and all the world religions, they always gave some credit to Jesus Christ. The Muslims say that he was a, uh, a prophet. Uh, the Krishnas say that he was an incarnation of the Godhead in his age. Uh, Yogananda and all these different Eastern teachers said that he had Christ consciousness. You know, they always use words like Christ consciousness, Christ this, Jesus that. Uh, the Buddhists would even say he was a Buddha. You know, he was a another incarnation of God like Buddha was. And uh, in all my searchings, I, I saw that all these people were pointing to Jesus. They're going, well, yeah, Jesus is one of the ways, but we're one of the ways. And they wouldn't all agree on anything except that Jesus was one of the ways. And then I looked into the Bible in uh, John chapter 14, I think it is, or John chapter 6, yeah, it's 6, mm -hmm. where he says, uh, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. So they all gave him credit, and he only gave himself credit. And I went, well, that kind of eliminates everybody. They all say he's cool, and, and he says he's the only one that's going to get you there, so I guess I'm safe. So I started praying to Jesus. I, I did this all through intellectual reasoning and laid it out on the table and figured it out that if they all gave him credit, and he only gave himself credit, and, and they all agreed on one thing, that he was one of the ways, and he, he only agreed that he was the only way. So I figured I had no choice but to go with him. And then I started praying to Jesus. Wow. <laughs> was that another trip for you? Like you, in reading for your two biographical sketch, yeah, you'd gone through the, your child of the 60s, eh? In, in some ways. Yes, and, you've, and the early 70s. Yeah, and you've done, you've done all the, you've done all the uh, experimentation, whether it's the, uh, the mind trip, uh, the, mm -hmm. the chemical trip, and mm -hmm. so forth. At what point in your, in your relationship with Christ, did, you, did it all of a sudden occur to you that it wasn't the same as the other trips. In 1973, I started praying to Jesus. In 1975, I was born again. I, I, was, I went through an experience called the Baptism of the Holy Spirit in May of 1975. Uh, was baptized in water in June and got into fellowship right there. And, and since then, it's been, you know, so gun hope. But, but for two years, it was just a trip. I was just, a, Jesus was another guru. Yes. You know, I was reading Bibles and uh, praying, but uh, I wasn't born again. Mm -hmm. I didn't what made the difference? What was that crucial moment of being born again? Accepting Jesus Christ as God 
and accepting the Bible as literally word for word he, truth. I mean, prior it, to that time, he was a guru. He, he, a guru. He, he was a master. He, he was wasn't a teacher. God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God oh, no. with us. No, that was, see, in Christian science, what I was brought up, to say that Jesus was God was blasphemy. Uh, they made a very heavy emphasis on that, that Jesus was God. That was the main stumbling block to me. And I remember one day in the summer of 75, walking down the street and looking up and going, all right, Jesus, I buy it. You're God. And everything snapped. Bang. Just like that. Just like that. You knew that was it. You were born again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's the, isn't that the test that John says, that, that we confess that, that uh, Jesus is God come in the flesh? Amen. Yeah. Amen. And it's interesting that that snaps psychologically and spiritually and uh, well, mentally it, with you. The that, only uh, way you can become born again is by your own will accepting Jesus as who he is, who he said he was. Uh, you can't become born again unless your will agrees to be born again and agrees to let him, excuse me, make you born again. And uh, I was holding out. I was very stubborn. I didn't want to be religious. I didn't want to be traditional. I didn't want to be... I didn't, even want, I didn't want to be classified with the Protestants and Catholics fighting in Ireland and the Muslims and Christians fighting in, in Lebanon and, and the charlatans on TV and radio that spend 10 minutes preaching and 50 minutes begging for money. And I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that. You know, I, I, there was so much hypocrisy. If it wasn't for hypocrisy, I would have become a Christian five years before that. But uh, all the Christians I knew were so busy getting blessed. They were so busy going to functions and concerts and listening to their Christian albums and going to their fundraising dinners and all these things. But the Jehovah's Witnesses would come to my door and spend four or five hours with me. I didn't find a Christian that had that time for me. Mm -hmm. And I was needing that love and that well, example. You know, you, you mentioned, uh, like, like uh, the way you were brought up, it was blasphemy to say that Jesus oh, yes. was God. Well, now, uh, those that came to your door and spent four or five hours teach that he's some kind of an angel. Oh, absolutely. No, that's, that's, you know, no, and no. Well, did you discover that as, yes, as, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, they would come in with their... Uh, their teaching? No, well, the or, thing or is, how did that come? It was really a blessing because at the time when the Jehovah's Witnesses would come to my door and argue with me for four hours, uh, I, uh, I didn't want to be part of any organized religious experience. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I turned them off as I would have turned Baptists if they would have come to the door, unless they would have, you know, been able to show me the. Tr I was looking for the true spirit of Christ. I was looking for the Holy Spirit. I was looking for the true Jesus. It was kind of like in a world of false Jesuses. Will the real Jesus please stand up kind of a thing. I was looking for the same Jesus that died on the cross, you know. But at the moment that you said, okay, Jesus. You're God. You are God. It all came together. You right knew mm -hmm. that your search was finished. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, blessed is the is the man who's found the object of his search. You know, there's some people who take searching itself and they deify that. Right. They worship the act of searching. I am a seeker. Right. Yes. But how did you know that Jesus was God? He proved it to me. How? He changed me. That was the greatest miracle that he could have done. I could have seen, you know, Mount Everest go skipping across the United States and jump into the ocean, and that wouldn't have done as much for me as him changing me. Uh, in a... Well, for those two years, like I said, I prayed to him. And he, through his grace and mercy and patience, wooed me <laughs> step by step through yeah. the Bible. Wooed me just between my own personal search and brought me to a place where I was willing to be a religious fool. Where I was willing to be a radical. Where I was willing to be made a complete uh, laughingstock. Before that, I wasn't willing to go door to door, or willing to go out on the streets, or willing to go into prisons, or willing to go to people and go, do you know Jesus? I said, I'll never do that. I, I wasn't willing to be made a fool for Christ. And for those two years, he wooed me. And then, like I said, in, in uh, April of 75, I was baptized in the Spirit, in uh, uh, April, May, right around there, and, and got into fellowship with a fine fellowship in California uh, called the Vineyard Christian Fellowship. Ken Gullickson is pastor. And, uh, uh, then right in that time, and w when I received Jesus as Savior and Lord, I still didn't believe. Now, I, I believed that, that he could be God, but I didn't believe he was absolutely God in the flesh. And uh, it took about two more months after that, and he was patient with me. Now, I don't know what, exactly what moment I was born again. Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. You know. But you, to your friends who have gone through all the kind of religious tripping that you have gone right. through, they say to you, fine. We'll give you a couple more I've years. I've won a lot of them to Jesus by just sitting down and showing them that I believe what I'm asking them to believe. See, witnessing, you, you win half the battle when you, tell them, when you can convince someone you believe. 
Mm-hmm. That's if you can't get someone to believe something that you can't convince them you don't believe. Keith, yeah. your pulpit. When you talk to young people like those, there were hundreds and hundreds there, but 150 of them came to give their lives to Jesus. Right. Your pulpit is the piano. Yes. We prayed for your voice. <laughs> we just believe the Lord. How does it feel? Sounds good Fine. to me. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. going to ask you, we've got, listen, we've got, I don't know, maybe five, six, or seven minutes through until the one-hour break. We have right. to take a one-hour break today. Would you just take that time? right up to that break and, and the floor manager will count you to the point where you've got to quit okay. and go on over to that piano and just minister, give an invitation, okay. do whatever you wish, Keith, and, and just talking to the young people, invite them to use the phones or, or, or whatever, you just feel free because there is Keith Green's pulpit, the piano. Praise the Lord. Keith, just minister to us.